Bye, guys. Bye. <laughs> All right, so I, oh, I'm unfortunately going sort of sideways here for computer control. Um, audio, can everybody hear Mark? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. Mark, can you hear people? <laughs> of course, yeah. Yeah, 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 I'm fine. Yeah, fine. <laughs> All right, fantastic, Mark. So first, thank you very much uh, for coming and talking to us. It's uh, really a, a pleasure. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. And you guys yeah. aren't too far too from far. me. You're you're right up the road. Yeah, you're in Seattle, right? Yep. Sweet. So we are in the same time zone. You know, I just didn't know, you know, where you were. Oh yeah, yeah. In fact, uh, if you do you know this area pretty well? No, I do not. Yeah. Uh, well, okay. I'm I'm on one of the islands north of Seattle, near just just south of the San Juans. Ah, okay. Yeah, Actually, so that was one of our questions. With uh, we we were wondering where you know that beach scene in. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can tell you exactly where that is. That is on Whidbey Island, W H I D B E Y, and it is uh, a little bay called Useless Bay. Terrible name, but that's where I grew up. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, so useless bay. Yeah. Who was it? Josh, you wanted to. And where in that scene? Where were you looking out towards? Say that one more time. Where were you looking out towards in that scene? From... I'm I'm, I'm, pick, I'm picking up a little muffle from him. Can you can you translate? So where were you looking? You were looking towards what place? Oh, I was I was looking to towards Seattle. Seattle was in the distance, uh, due south, <laughs> roughly. Yeah. Okay, great. Anyways, let's get um, started. So we, I sent you that list of questions. Yep. Um, that um, and we've revised them a little bit. Okay. Um, so we'll just go around, and each student will have a question for you. Okay. But, um, I can try that. Wait. So the side is rather difficult, but. Yeah. See if we can get uh, maybe a list of questions below here. Are Hold you on. gonna go? Are you gonna go through them in order? Uh, perhaps. Okay. You're gonna, the order's changed, I believe, from what you have this morning because we just had a quick discussion and. Oh no worries. Order a little bit. I'm sure these are all questions you've faced. I uh, yes, I have had these questions before. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so let's. Second, you can see the question at the bottom there. Yeah. 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 All right, Josh, I think you were the first. Mm -hmm. um, let's try. Hi, so our first question is, do you feel that behind the curve is a good representation of your views? Um, behind the curve, was it a good representation of what was happening in the flat earth? It was in, you remember when it was shot, it was shot in 2017. Mm -hmm. So it was, okay short version everybody in flat earth hates it and everybody from outside of flat earth all the globalists including probably most of you uh, think it's really interesting which is why we're having this discussion and i had a chance to see it in different film festivals uh in different states and including um one in toronto that's where it premiered and what was interesting to me was the people that saw it in the audience initially for the first 20 minutes thought it wasn't even real they thought it was a piece of docu fiction, and then afterwards, once but by the time they got to about the hundred minute mark, which was the end of the movie, they realized it was real. So uh, for us, it became a Trojan horse. Uh, I would I have changed a few things in it. Yeah, I, I probably would have tweaked a few things because the director, by the time he got done, it took us about seven months to shoot it. The director hated us. <laughs> well, he didn't hate us as much as he hated the topic. Uh, and you, you wouldn't know that because he didn't give it away. It was really subtle, but in the director's commentary, real quick, I, I'm, I don't want to drag out this question too much. Uh, in the director's commentary on iTunes, when, if you remember in the movie, when that 12 year old kid came up to ask me on, uh, when I was up on the podium, he asked me a question. Uh, that's, they all just chimed in immediately and said, oh yeah, this is when we had to take a stand. Uh, basically against flat earth because you know it's all fun and games until the kids are involved and it's like wow really so um but yeah would it would i have changed just a couple things yeah but for the most part no i wouldn't have changed it because it was safe for the audience 
Uh, even the title, Behind the Curve, it made people going in going, oh, we're going to make fun of Flat Earthers, which it did in some ways, but it was fine because it, it raised awareness. Thanks. Yeah. Um, next question. Um, so the next question was, why do you think the Earth is flat? <laughs> what is the single strongest piece of evidence uh, for a flat Earth? That's two questions, but that's okay. <laughs> uh, no, no, it's fine. Um, the first one seems a little obvious, but it's a, it's a good question. And I'm really, I kind of wish more people would ask me that in the future. Um, I think the Earth is flat because I can't prove it's a globe anymore. And by that, I mean, for anyone there, it's like, can I, get, can I prove to you right now that it, the world is flat, that it's enclosed? No, I can't. Can I create so much reasonable doubt in the globe that the only place you have left to go is some sort of flat enclosed model? Yeah, I can. I can do that all day long. And I know there's some scientific types that will say, well, a reasonable doubt isn't enough. And I go, oh, no, no. yes, it is. Every hour of every day and every court you can think of, reasonable doubt will win. And that's, that's what we've done. Uh, as far as the best, and I don't know if that's one of the other questions in here, uh, the strongest evidence wasn't even something I came up with, which was long distance photography. Uh, in, in the clues, nowhere at any point in the clues that I say, hey, go out to the beach with an HD camera and crank up the zoom and see if you can see objects that are gone. You know, the, you, know you see the boat going over the curve. That's probably the most obvious one. The, the boat's gone, right? You, you see the boat go over the horizon, it appears to go hole first and it's gone forever. Remember, it's on the other side of the curve. And HD, and 10 years ago, I would have said, yeah, I'm totally there with you. But HD technology has changed that to where now we can pull back objects into frame, which are at ridiculous distances. As a matter of fact, the only limit to our photography now is the thickness of the atmosphere itself. Because remember, what you're breathing in right now is kind of like a thin version of water. It's kind of a soup. So it's only 99.99%, uh, even at this range, uh, transparent. And then it gets thicker and thicker and thicker. And sorry, the follow-up question to that would be, or the follow-up uh, statement is because people have asked me, oh, why can't you see Japan from uh, California? Or why can't you see Europe from New York? Or why can't you see Mount Everest from everywhere? And I say, well, because of the thickness of the atmosphere. If you pulled out the atmosphere, actually, I think you probably could see a very, very long distance. All right, there you go. Thank you. Yep. Uh, oh, let me get down to the questions here. All right, next question. So uh, what is the most challenging piece of spherical Earth evidence for you to reconcile? Got it. And the other way of asking that is, what is, uh, what is the weakest part of flat Earth? Uh, it, it's, it's basically the same, same question, uh, same answer. And it's the, uh, the Antarctic sun. Uh, most people don't ask it, uh, which is, how can you have 24-hour sunlight in Antarctica? if it's a flat world because it doesn't make sense because the light source can only be in one place at one time uh, and yet supposedly there's a 24-hour sun in Antarctica that that's the weakest part we don't know what what's happening out there why you know are there multiple light sources is there something going on with the light sources we don't know about possibly uh, luckily for us though the Antarctic Treaty trumps all of that Meaning, you know, you, the only people that are really allowed in Antarctica are military and military scientists, which is, again, fascinating to me. And why one of the reasons I built the clues was based on that, which was no corporation in any country, no matter how much money they have, is allowed to go down there. And it's the only piece of real estate that's owned by no one. So, but yeah, that's our, that's our weakest argument, I think. That's an interesting statement because like we have uh, there's a course running uh, I believe it's in March it's a Quest University course uh, yeah. called Quest for Antarctica and a bunch of students go down to Antarctica. Oh yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, with money you can go. Yeah, oh well, yeah, no, yeah, of course. I mean, you can spend. Well, sorry, let me, let me revise the first statement. You, if you want to go as a tourist and have your picture taken with with penguins, yeah, you can do it all day long. They'll take you to the peninsula. You can ride on rafts and wear those orange suits and and it's really really cool uh but from a corporate standpoint you can't do anything down there i mean that and that to me is just a freaking miracle because we all know i i, I can't speak for canadia but uh it, you the world is run on greed and money and power uh and this and, and so if you want like in the united states if we want to start fracking in your backyard we can do it 
In fact, we have many, many times. And yet, even though there's tons of resources down there, no corporation, not only are they not allowed to go down there, they're not even allowed to talk about it, which just blows my mind. It's like, you know, if, if you're the head of British Petroleum, for example, and, you know, we already know there's oil down there. You, I would run a, a full page ad in the London Times every freaking week and say, oh, yeah, you know, how great it would be for us to go down there. They're not even allowed to do that, which means there's a gag order at the highest level. And I find it fascinating. Thanks. Yep. Uh, the next question. So we sent you some uh, we sent you some graphs. Did you get those? I did. I, I yeah. know I know exactly what this question is. And how does the how can the flight times work on a flat earth? Yeah. you're right with some flights no we don't we don't know uh there are some perspective issues when it comes to the outer rim when it comes to it comes to the flat earth model uh we i mean is there a, is there a super jet stream that we don't know about that's carrying the planes at a higher rate of speed maybe is there something else going on i don't know uh, initially but but i don't tend to worry about it because of and i don't know if you guys actually watch the clues or if you just watch the the documentary but that's why I did Clue 9, for example, which was when I did Clue 7, uh, which said, OK, find me nonstop flights in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, which, again, 95 percent of them are not. Ninety five percent of them are connection and double connections, which are just ridiculous. And they all go north. Uh, but the other thing was find me the route. I mean, the flight times is one thing, but show me the route, because when these planes go, what you're saying here, the uh, the route can't be proven because the GPS drops off. Again, which is fascinating uh, because remember the um, when the GPS system, which is a, an American defense system, 32 blanket coverage satellites, uh, when they when these planes get off out of land radar range, which is about 150, 200 miles tops, their latitude and longitude coordinates drop off. They literally go into not available and they go into estimated or approximated mode, which means, oh, yeah, we kind of know where the planes are, but we can't tell you exactly where the planes are which leads into the whole, you know, that whole Malaysian flight thing, if you guys are old enough to remember that. Thanks. Uh, and the next question. Um, so we're wondering how seasons work in the flat earth model. Seasons, got it. Uh, two, two parts to, the, to, to that answer. The first one would be, and again, I know you guys are super young. If, does anyone even, even own like a, like a record player, like a real record player? Yeah. Okay. Well, for those of you who own vinyl or, or DJ on the weekends, uh, the, a needle on a record player, as the song goes on, moves closer towards the center. And if you want to back it out, it goes, it goes that way. Meaning for us, the sun and the moon don't take the exact same path, sort of like a needle on a record player. Every time they move slightly in or slightly out, uh, that would account for most of the seasons. But then also in an enclosed system, because we're talking about a building, basically, with walls and a floor and a ceiling, the, the heating and cooling and how the seasons work wouldn't be just dependent on the sun. It would also, you could also use the jet stream, the underwater conveyor system, the magma system underneath, and all sorts of other fun things if you wanted to. So, but yeah, the, the first one's generally the answer I give to people, but the second one is kind of a more detailed, it's like, okay, if, if you had an enclosed system, if it, we are living in a big box, then when it comes to seasons, it's all artificial. So take, take dealer's choice on that one. So I'd love to be the repairman on the AC condition, the AC of the, of the earth. Eh? Oh, yeah, yeah. By the way, and thank you, by the way, for, for bringing that up. Because, yeah, if, if, it, if we are talking about an artificial system, and I know it's not one of your questions, but I, I might want to ask it because or throw it out there which is people have been asking me over the last two years uh, what I think about climate change. And, you know, because a lot of conspiracy people don't believe in climate change. It's like, oh, it's a hoax, like everything else. And it's like, well, it may be a hoax, but look, I was getting a tan here in Seattle last Halloween uh, for like an entire week. That shouldn't even be possible. Uh, and doesn't it make more sense if we're talking about greenhouse gases, if what we're living in is an actual greenhouse? Just saying. I, makes makes a little more sense. So do I believe that climate change is possible? Oh yeah, a lot more possible in something like this. And what you what you just said, the AC system would have to compensate for what we're doing here. Thank you. Next question. Um, do you think the earth could be in the shape of a bowl? Say that one more time. Do you think the earth could be in the shape of a bowl? Oh, you're the bowl question. 
Um, uh, no, actually, you know, believe it or not, there are some fringe flat earth people that believe in what's known as concave earth, which is that what you're talking about there, that it's bowl shaped. The only problem there is we haven't found any evidence of an upturn anywhere, which means if it is sort of bowl shaped, where does that bowl start? So, uh, I don't want to get into this. This question gets a little tricky. There's an old, old map. You guys can look it up. Uh, it's called. It's by a guy called Orlando <laughs> Ferguson, who wrote. Who, who came up with a map, and it was kind of bowl shaped. But really, when you stare at it, it's bowl shaped on the outside, and then at the center, it's kind of raised, and it looks kind of like a roulette table. And so initially, when I uh, when I was talking about the flat Earth, I go, yeah, it could look like a roulette table. Roulette table. But then uh, the conspiracy people came right after me. They said, no, you can't say the rule. You can't say roulette table anymore. I go, why not? They, because they said all the numbers on a roulette table add up to 666. And I go, what? <laughs> I go, is that real? It actually is real. That's, that's a real thing. It, who, who would have known that? So is it possible that it's concave, bowl shaped? Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to throw it out entirely. But it, we don't see any evidence of that because it's somewhere on the horizon... And if it's only about bowl shaped on the edge, yeah, possibly. But in the middle, we think it's absolutely flat. How's that? If it's if you're thinking it's like a perfect like a like a U bowl shaped, we don't see any evidence of that because in in the horizon you would you would start to see the horizon move up, and we and we don't see that at all. We just see flat. Thanks. Yep. Next next question. Uh, do you think the spherical Earth evidence of ancient philosophers has valid? I take it as the spherical earth evidence. I don't even call it spherical earth evidence. I call it um, hints, which, yeah, I mean, it was the best they had to go with at the time. I mean, they were taking a guess. So like, here, I'll give you a perfect example. Um, there's a wonderful quote by George Orwell, and he made this in 1946. And he, he, it was a, he was writing a journal. He wasn't, wasn't a flat earther, but he said, you know, it's interesting. You go to anybody on the street, and you ask them how they know the world is a globe. And their first response is always, well, duh, we know. It's, it's a given, right? It's like Game of Thrones. It is known, right? It's like, and then when you press them on that, uh, they say, they get angry because they don't know. The question is, how did everybody in the world know that it was a globe in 1946? NASA wasn't even founded until 1958. How did they know? You t that goes to your ancient philosophers. They, were, they didn't know. They were told this. So, in fact, if you remove all the space agencies, you know, because, again, 1946, there's no, no space agencies, what do you have to go off of? Well, okay, you got two things. One is ships going over the horizon, which HD technology is just blown out of the water. And then you have the sticks and shadows argument, which most people don't know what the ancient philosophers got into. And the sticks and shadows argument is fine, except that it's completely relative, meaning... Yeah, sticks and shadows works if the sun is really, really huge and 93 million miles away. But it also works if the sun is really, really close and really, really small. Works almost the exact same way. So is it evidence? No. I, because, again, until you get high enough to see the world for yourself, you don't know. You, you just don't. And again, the space age, and so then it comes to the question of if the best, if our best and brightest didn't figure it out, the United States and the Soviet Union didn't figure it out until almost 1960, would you tell the general population? Would you tell everybody? Now, your knee jerk response may be, oh, sure, the, the public has a right to know. But if you're in seats of power, the, the upheaval could, the potential, I mean, academically, oh my God. But think of think of just your your institution academically what that would mean astrophysics and astronomy gone immediately uh the remaining physical sciences uh geology hydrology archaeology biology they'd have to be retooled from the ground up not just academics not to mention um e economic and religious it's just it's too much of a risk so sorry i was going off into the weeds there but <laughs> the next question that's great uh what's the, the who's on the next question what would happen if the flat Earth theory became accepted? Would it become a dogmatic principle like the spherical Earth? Oh, what would happen if the the flat Earth, the, the whole flat Earth thing became a reality? Um, the end of the world, basically. Um, no, it wouldn't be that bad. Uh, but, but I have to mention that because uh, National Geographic asked me that very question. Uh, and they cut it out of the segment. It was really interesting. At the very end of the interview, 
they sat down and everybody else had left except for the the main teams and the producer and it was still on camera and they said they said isn't it possible you know what happens to medicine what happens to technology what happens to science what happens to civilization as we know it uh is it possible that flat earth could usher in a new dark age i'm going wow that seems a bit heavy man you know you're getting all captain bring down on me but it was it was a good question which is we we don't know um i'd like to think from what i've seen over the last four years because again i'm one of the oldest ones in this and we've only been doing this four years uh i would like to think that it would be a positive thing it would it would unify us in some way i mean there's some people that say you know it could create a new golden age because if you're all living in the same building you're all part of the same family do you still go to war if you're all in the same building at that point because you know you're basically fighting inside a giant boat <laughs> you know do you do you go to war if you're all in the, in the same structure um and to that effect if it was built that means there's somebody looking over your, shul your shoulder. Now, I'm not saying it's, you know, the traditional uh, God, you know, uh, Santa Claus basically in a bathroom on Sunday. But at the same time, it could be, you know, a parent looking over the top of his newspaper, you know, on the couch, making sure you don't burn things down. Do you still act the way you do if you know for a fact there's a higher power out there? You know, something. I, I don't think you would. I don't think you'd commit hate crimes. I don't think you'd commit sex crimes. Or do it. In fact, I, I have gone so far as to say, since I've gotten into this, I will never do a malicious thing to anybody again in my life. Gun to my head, I will not do it. Uh, because I think there's there's something bigger. And I think this is proof of it. Uh, do you believe that the government will like, be affected if flat earth is true? Yeah, yeah, but they have an out. The, the government, especially NASA, United States will, will take a beating on this one because, you know, NASA was the ones that, uh, you know, you have to start with the Apollo program. Basically, what I'm saying is the entire NASA program and they get paid oof, 50, 53, 54 million dollars a day. That's their budget. They they committed fraud. But did they do it for our own good or were they instructed to, to, to do it? That's their out. You know, they could they can always say if that happens. You know, you, you probably remember, you may be old enough to remember uh, a few years ago or 10 years ago, the whole too big to fail concept, which was if, it, if a financial institution is too big to fail, um, that means that if it collapses, the whole economy goes with it. Uh, the United States government would have an out in that it would say, look, the public just wasn't ready. They could make up any focus groups they wanted. They could say, look, we sat down with 100 people and told them, you know, what, what the deal was. And they didn't take it well. Sort of like, uh, not to go off on a tangent here, sort of like Roswell. The stories that came out of Roswell in the 1940s. People panicked in the beginning when that story came out. And the United States government walked it back very, very quickly. So, and then they said, oh, no, no, it's a weather balloon because the public wasn't ready. I don't think the public was ready in 1960. I do think they are now. And I think the government could survive, potentially. Heck, how, how could the United States not? We have a reality television star as, uh, the, as the president currently. It, how much worse can it get? Uh, next question. So whether it's through the educational system or some other medium, how do you envision incorporating religion? I, I didn't catch that last part of the question. Could you tell me it? Yeah. So whether it's through the educational system or a different medium, how do you envision incorporating universal information? So if you were to pass down that the earth is flat, how would you pass down that information in a way that people Oh, oh, no. Oh, no, it's a great question. Wow. Th thank you, by the way. That's, that's an original question I haven't gotten. Uh, we're doing it <laughs> right now. Meaning what what's changed over the last 50 years is that it used to be, you know, just in the United States, just three television stations. And some radio that was based in some newspapers, but it was slow. And nowadays, I mean, we've got the perfect infrastructure to spread the word instantly. As you know, when it comes to the internet, things are really, really fast. Uh, between um, social media, high speed internet, and six billion smartphones, you now can get you can now push the same narrative to all to all these different facets. And so we've been kind of working our way into we we started out pretty small. Just a few podcasts here and there, and then mainstream kind of picked it up as a novelty, and we caught some breaks with celebrities, you know, different people from from athletes to comedians to whoever else was out there. 
talking about it. And so now we're just trying to find new avenues. The only thing we haven't done is primetime television, uh, but that looks like it's going to change. Next year, we, we've already got a, a primetime thing in the works. And from what I can tell, it's, it's going to happen. So that yeah that's basically how we're doing it we're just trying to the just news like like doing cnn and fox and nbc and abc isn't enough anymore uh, we we needed to uh expand through just about every different facet of social media and that's tough to do because there's so many different outlets uh but we we've, we've done it pretty well so far so that's that's it i mean that's that's how we're doing it social media short short answer yep so how, how do you create a structure so that once you do pass down your vision or your truth, people don't end up challenging it in the same way that you challenge this challenge the spirit board? Oh, no, 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 no. We want them to challenge it. It's not, it's so as far as the structure goes, good, another good question. Uh, there is no structure, which is why it has spread the way it has. What's interesting, and you probably saw that in the documentary, hell, we, we, we got 30% of our members don't even believe in the dome. They don't even believe in the box because they don't like the concept of the box. They just, they know it's flat, but they say, no, the box, we don't, don't fence me in, man. You know, they, they feel claustrophobic. And I get it. It's usually the, the more artistic types. It's like, no, man, you're putting limits on the whole thing. It's like, well, it's physics wise. It's how it would work. But um, as far as structure goes, the reason why it's spreading is because our structure is so loose, uh, which is why I made the analogy to the, uh, the clans of the Scottish Highlands. We have a lot of disagreements. Oh, my God. We, we fight constantly internally over different aspects of the, the model. It, but at the end of the day, everyone can agree. Well, it's like, OK, it's not a globe. We're still working out the finer points, but that's it. And so when it comes to people challenging it, oh no, we want them to challenge it. In fact, that's how everybody got into it. Um, you probably saw in the documentary, or I hope, I hope it was in there, which is the reason everybody gets into it, the reason why people get sucked into it is because they try to disprove it, me included. Which is like every, the t-shirt the reads, I became a flat earther because I tried to disprove it. Everybody go. Nobody loves the flat Earth going in. It's like this is because it's instinctual. It's like, oh, that's stupid. <laughs> why would you look at that? And and then you think about it. It's like, well, why is it stupid? And then you try to go down those roads to where you're 100 percent satisfied internally of your answer, and you can't do it most of the time. You, there's always some little thread that's hanging, and it just keeps getting you know pulled and pulled and pulled. So no, we 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 don't we want people to challenge it but we don't even have to worry about that because everybody getting into the community challenges it to start we we don't even have a recruiting process we just, we just you know say oh yeah by the way the earth is flat we don't very very few times if you say oh yeah join us we just say it kind of in joking because if you can convert somebody in an hour uh there's probably something wrong with them it's seriously that the the fastest person i've ever seen converted i think it was a woman women get it they're way more open-minded than men are men are stubborn um she turned in 20 minutes i know it turned sounds like a vampire thing but it is kind of like that flat earthers are kind of like happy little vampires going around turning people so <laughs> all right uh then thanks next question yeah um in the documentary um it will focus more on flat earthers in the u.s but are there flat earth movements from non-Western countries and cultures? Okay, so the question, and, and forgive me, at, at, so the, the table is messing with, with the audio a little bit, but I, I think your question was, are there other flat earthers in other countries and how does it work? Yeah, other yeah. non-Western countries. Oh, oh, you mean like, like non-English speaking countries? Yeah, non-European. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, you're right because most of the stuff that I deal with is United States and Canada and UK and South Africa, and New Zealand, and basically everybody in the Crown, uh, yep. and then of course Europe. So, but what we found is, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of translators that go from English to the other countries. But you want to have some fun, and it is absolutely out there. I did this. Oh, wow, at least a year and a half ago. Um, type in flat Earth into google and then translate it to any other language you know just the term flat earth and then plug that term back into google it's amazing asia is huge south america is huge russia is big into it uh estonia i don't know why kind of like david hasselhoff is big in germany we're huge in estonia i have no idea why so yeah we're, we're big everywhere uh but it's not that unified i mean yeah we have a lot of chapters in different places 
but we don't have um and like that there was you probably saw there was a um a flat earth football club down in ooh, i think it's spain and uh you know we we we've got like one guy you know that can translate spanish to english and so we're kind of we're kind of in that realm but the rest of them we don't know like one of our guys uh, from seattle at d marble he was invited to a um uh, a flat earth conference in south korea and he went and you know he had a translator with him but yeah we're everywhere at this point because in fact let me expand on that real quick it doesn't not only is language not a barrier for flat earth it doesn't it crosses all demographics so it doesn't matter how rich how powerful how beautiful how talented you are it will make its way into just about every conversation and here's why uh, think about it. every time you run into somebody you haven't seen in a while in the street right well the f first thing you talk about you talk about the weather you talk about local sports teams and people you mutually know but usually before the conversation ends one of one or both of you tell an interesting story before you go it's like oh yeah i heard if you eat three ounces of dark chocolate you know it helps prevent cancer something like that and then flat earth now has made its way into that conversation which is why i call it a uh, a campfire story which is it doesn't even need the internet anymore it's easy to explain the core to people without even breaking out your phone thanks yeah. uh, uh next question all right. So, in theory, what evidence would be enough to change your mind? Ah, uh, yes. Is there something that could change my mind, make me not a flat earther? Yeah, and I've given this a lot of thought over the last uh, three years. Um, there'd be two ways to do it. One would be for everybody in the community, not just me. Uh, which would be get any 4K camera, strap it to a rocket that is going to leave orbit, turn it on, make sure it's on the top stage, not the first two stages, which they tend to drop it off of, and never hit the pot, you know, the unedited footage, 4K. You know, it has never been done in the history of space travel, which is statistically impossible. Which is that, you know, where, you know, it takes off off the launch pad and the earth cur starts curving below it. And then, you know, and, and you say, well, no, we saw that with the whole Elon Musk, Tesla and space thing. It's like, no, no, you didn't. No, you didn't. They just turned on the cameras once it supposedly was in orbit. That would be the first thing, you know, just show me any 4K footage anywhere. I mean, I, I thought it was amazing enough, not that we could do it. Um or go back and find it, but, you know, that any astronaut couldn't do a 360, you know, from Gemini and Apollo and Mercury, you know, nobody, nobody had moving camera footage. But the other one that would convince me, which is because that's like, okay, well, putting a 4K camera on a rocket, that's going to take a lot of different strings to pull, and you're probably not going to get authorization to do that. So somebody said, well, is there anything you could do down on the ground? I go, yeah, the spacesuit challenge, which I put out there, and it's in the, uh, I think it's the description box of every video I make now. And I, I put the challenge out on my podcast every every week and for the last year and a half at least. And I say this, I say the spacesuit cannot work as advertised. It defies thermodynamics. And that is a spacesuit would turn into a basketball, go rigid and burst, and the guy would die. Tell me what is in that backpack that magically stops the uh, thermodynamic law, not, not a guideline, not a rule, but a law that says that pressure needs a container and a soft container will go rigid. And so my challenge is find me any sort of self-contained spacesuit, self-contained, none of that tethered junk, and throw me in a vacuum chamber and pull the switch. That's it. That's all you need to, to do. And I could prove it was a vacuum. Luckily, you can prove it's a vacuum with things you can buy down at a drugstore for all of like five bucks. That would do it uh that would that wouldn't it wouldn't necessarily get me away from flat earth but it would so demoralize me that i'd probably quit interesting i'm i as a physicist i'm thinking about that right now so uh, i i will oh. i will ever i will endeavor to to i i'll try to do that what I, yeah, give me a that. vacuum chamber I can make a vacuum chamber. Well, no, 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 not a vacuum. But it, I need a sp well, I need a spacesuit to go in the vacuum. I can't just walk in a vacuum chamber. I don't die horribly. No, no, no. But you don't need a human to walk in, but you can have a small model of a spacesuit. Yes, you could. Well, yeah, but then people are going to question. Not that I wouldn't question, but you'd have to have a detailed mock-up. But yeah, you could do. Well, to fabricate it would be tricky, but, but yeah, that's the, the point. Is if you guys don't know what I'm talking about here, is pressure needs a container. 
and meaning you can't have low pressure sitting next to high pressure. There's, it, does, it cannot exist in real life. And I'll give you a, a real quick example of that. Um, is there a second story? Is there a floor above you guys right now? Yep. Perfect. Okay, let's say you took that floor above you and you turned it into a vacuum chamber. You put a cork in the ceiling and you pop the cork. What's going to happen? You know exactly what's going to happen. The, the, the pressure is going to equalize. It's going to be instant. It's going to be violent. Most of you will black out. And some of you may even die. So the question is this. And, and because it's like, okay, why didn't gravity, which is in your room right now, why didn't gravity hold the air in your room? Why did it all of a sudden go upstairs? And that's because pressure has to equalize. It is just a law of thermodynamics. So where, why does, if we have a much, much, much bigger vacuum chamber, which is space, why is our atmosphere still here? What's holding it in? And you say, you'll say gravity. And I say, well, wouldn't, doesn't make any sense because gravity didn't hold it in your room right now. When you pop that cork, wouldn't it make more sense if you were literally in a pressurized container? Same thing applies to the spacesuit. And you guys can look this up. There's some wonderful videos out there. Look up a uh, vacuum versus steel rail car. That's a really fun video. Germans love doing this, showing this to people. I don't know why where um, they apply a vacuum field, not even a 90% vacuum field to a, a steel rail car, you know, train rail car, and it crushes. It's amazing. So all those movies you see in space where, you know, th there's a hole in the fuselage and it's like, we've got two minutes. Quick, get the, get the duct tape, get the gas mask. Oh my God, no. No, no, no. You don't have, you don't have two minutes. You don't have two seconds. It is instant. Everybody in that space station would die instantly. And that would be like, you know, if a micrometeor the size of a nickel, and yet these guys are flying, you know, floating around, not a care in the world, and their khakis and their polo shirts, and no shoes, none of the doors are shut between chambers, nobody seems to care, nobody has a, nobody worries about that sort of thing. Sorry, I ramble. No, thank you. No, I, I hadn't uh, reflected on that as a piece of evidence for you. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it, well, I, 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 I didn't, I didn't either for the first at least year and a half because uh, I had to come up with something. In fact, I turned it into a clue. It's called the lost nail, and it's based on that, uh, where I said, look, if the spacesuit cannot, does not work the way it's as advertised, then everything that you see a spacesuit in is completely fraudulent. And I'll, let me throw one more thing into you, into that, which is the, the spacesuit, it's, uh, I just lost my train of thought. The spacesuit, um, ah, crap, I lost uh, it. Anyway, next question, next question. I'll come back to it later. It, it'll come back. I'm yeah, sure. yeah. Uh, what is our next question? 12? Uh, I want you to know that uh, if you go, go into space to see the shape of the Earth, uh, would you do that? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, I volunteered first. First thing, people ask me that. I think in the first six months I was doing this, and I said, if you were allowed, you know, if somebody give you a trip to space, would you go? Yeah, yeah, of course I would. I, I wouldn't even hesitate. And uh, it would, yeah. And if I went up there and you know I saw there was a globe, yep, I would quit flat Earth and and be like, that's it. Good night, everybody. Roll credits. And the, not only do I not ever get offers, not even, not even half-assed offers. I don't get anything along those lines. Nobody has. Uh, it's, it's something they will not do. You can't, you can't. It's, it's, I mean, you gotta remember because people, I've had people say, well, you know, are you, are you accusing, the media has asked me, you know, are you accusing all astronauts of being liars? And I say, no, I'm not accusing them of anything. I'm saying they're soldiers. You got to remember that most of the people that even claim to be astronauts, they're high ranking Air Force officers, period. I mean, we're talking uh, colonels and lieutenant generals and guys like that. I mean, these guys are not, they're all military, every single one of them, except for, of course, the, the civilian group that died in the 80s, which we don't want to get into right now. Next what, if you, what if you could circumvent Antarctica? Circumnavigate? Circumnavigate. Oh, sure. In fact, that was one of the tests uh, that I came up with, which was if you want to prove the coastline of Antarctica, you want to prove it for, for good, it's it's easy. Um, all you need is, um, and yeah, you could do it with two two boats, but that'd be really, really um, uh, slow because, you know, you just have one boat going clockwise. So think of the, the world as like a clock face, right? And Antarctica would be all the, the numbers on the outside. Well, um, you start both boats at the six o'clock position. You have one go one way, one go the other way, and eventually they'll meet. 
Um, but you can do it much, much faster if you just have one boat sitting in the six o'clock position and then have a plane uh, fly, you know, either clockwise or counterclockwise and come back and eventually it's going to run to the boat. Uh, the problem with that is that you would have to you would have to use the Antarctic coastline for navigation purposes only. You you couldn't use a GPS and the compass would be basically useless. A lot of people don't know the compass is worthless down in the south, you know, when you get out to Antarctica, which is weird because it should be magnetic south and everybody down there says the same thing. It's like there is no magnetic south, which is what we, we expected. But um, the Antarctic Treaty forbids even, they, they even, they changed the Antarctic Treaty since we've been doing this to where now even planes would need special permission from multiple governments just to fly next to the coastline. But yeah, you could do it. Yeah, you're absolutely right. That That is one of the tests. And uh, our last question, but then I think we may have some more, some more. Uh, uh, that's fine. That's fine. Data to share with you. Uh, I will yeah. have time for you. So we want to know if there's anything you would want to, um, us to like take with us after this discussion. That that I'm sorry that one got completely garbled. Can, can can you tell me what she said? Is there anything you would like to leave us with? Anything? Oh, okay. You want to take from this conversation? Yeah, 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 yeah. And 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 I know we we can we we can have some questions after this, sure. Um, but yeah, I'll I'll tell you the same thing I tell everybody, which is do not take my word for it. As a matter of fact, the the chapter of um, my new book. Um, I think where's my new book? Uh, this book right here, Flat Earth Clues, End of the World, just released it. Um, the first chapter is literally called Look Away, which is uh, if you like the world the way it is, if you wake up and say everything is awesome, and you think you get a good bead on things, don't look at Flat Earth because it is a rabbit hole with literally there's a point of no return. And we have a 99% retention rate. Meaning once you go into flat earth, if you finally get invested in it, there's nothing to go back to. It's very much a red pill, blue pill. And I know the matrix is 20 years old now. God, I'm getting old. Uh, but it's, it's kind of like that. It's, it's like you can't, there's, you can't go back to the globe even if you wanted to. You may not be as enthusiastic about flat earth, but you can't go back to it. Um, and by that, so what I mean is this. Don't take my word for it because, yeah, who am I? You know, I'm just throwing some stuff out there at you. I'm not here to convince you. I'm not even here to persuade you. I'm here to just give you something different to think about. Figure it out for yourself. Do your own research. Ask questions. That's literally what I put at the end of every video. Well, a lot of the old videos I made, uh, which is that's how everybody gets into it. And I'm, I'm just, I just plant the seed. I am the freshman recruiter for what we kind of call Flat Earth University which is we you know we we and it's this on weird loosely based online campus so again figure it out for yourself you may it's polarizing so you may hate it now and i did too and i don't blame you you're probably just like oh this guy's crazy no one would ever ever believe in it but at the same time what i what i did for my um my opening speech uh for my 2019 speech i i kind of opened with a statement which is um science is only right until the day that it's wrong meaning uh i'll give you a quick quick example um let's let's go with like an old oldie but goodie conspiracy the loch ness monster you guys ever heard of the loch ness monster yeah kind of okay so the loch ness monster is that uh, there's dinosaurs um swimming around a lake over in the uk right that's impossible why well because dinosaurs are extinct they've been extinct for hundreds of millions of years right at least 100 million years so then I throw at you the coelacanth fish, which is spelled C-O-E-L-A-canth, C-A-N-T-H. The coelacanth fish. Uh, been dead for 70 million years. Fossils, everybody was absolutely 100% convinced this thing was extinct. And then they caught one in a net off of South Africa. And then another one off of Madagascar and then other countries in Africa. And then National Geographic finally ran a special and they're swimming around with scuba divers. So how did they get it completely wrong? How did science screw up so badly on that one? It's because once they saw the fossils, they stopped looking. They, they said, oh, that's it. Case closed. RIP. Fish dead. Well, it wasn't dead. So now when I come to you and I say, are there dinosaurs swimming around a lake in the UK? And you say, well, no. It's like, why? Because they've been dead for 100 million years. 
Really? Because that fish was dead for 70 million years. Fish is alive. And if that fish was more elusive and didn't get caught in the net, science would still be laughing even today. It'd be like, some guy said he caught that fish. Hey, a kid who caught that fish. That fish is dead. So don't be so sure. I know, I know you, you're in a university. Everything in textbooks is absolutely true. Well, everything in media is also true, right? Nobody ever lies about anything. No cover-ups, no conspiracies. One of, one of the one of the really uh, our university's um, our taglines. It's no longer our tagline, but uh, was question everything. Yeah. So, oh, oh I, lo I love question everything. I do. I get, just don't. Yeah, don't don't take everything at face value. There's an old old saying which is um, it's <laughs> maybe an American saying which is trust everyone but count your change. You know, don't if if there's something in your gut that says, man. I don't know if I'm buying it. Don't just gloss it over. You know, look into it yourself. Figure it out. Um, let, let me let me throw one more thing out, and then you guys can you know just free free fall um, or free flow questions. Which is, um, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson said that science is true whether or not you believe in it. And you know he's the most popular scientist in the world right now. And it's like wow, it's kind of arrogant. You know, it, it's like, it, if you want to tell me what the, the boiling temperature of water is at sea level? Yeah, I can test that right now. So can you. Tell me what the core of the Earth looks like. Well, that's a little tough, tougher to do. Remember, it's 4,000 miles of the core of the Earth. Deepest hole ever drilled is 8 miles. What's the core of the Earth look like? You don't know. But the we all see the diagrams. You see those wonderful, perfect cross sections with red and orange and yellow and white. But there's no small print. There used to be small print that says, we have no idea what's down there. But they put that there and people see it enough times when they're in school and then they believe it is gospel. Same thing. Let, let me end this part on this. Same thing with the globe and the flag. I don't know if you have like a Canadian flag in the corner of every classroom. You probably don't in universities. But in grade school, the American flag is in the corner of every uh, classroom that we have. Right. And that's amazing positive conditioning for the flag you know by the time you get through at least basic high school 12 years there's people that are willing to join the military partly because they just see that flag up in the corner well what's below that flag most of the time it's the globe it's amazing conditioning it's just a toy it's just a model that's sitting there you see that for 12 years though you believe it absolutely wholeheartedly why wouldn't you even though nasa wasn't even founded until you know pushing 1960 it's like oh no that's that's what it looks like really you sure yeah. Anyway, there you go. Yeah, what, so, what do you got? Thank you. So speaking of, you know, actually questioning it and actually going to see some kind of evidence. Yeah. Um, uh, did, did you want to discuss yeah. the video that you got or the, the test sure. that you did? Um, so uh, I went to sea level with a small research group yesterday. Sure. And sure. We, we were at two spots 4.5 kilometers away from one another. So I guess like three miles. Right. And um, we had a telescope with us at one side, and we positioned the telescope at about one meter high up from sea level. Sure. And then on the other on the other side, 4.5 kilometers away, we had a friend standing there, uh, holding a, a bright orange uh, orange lid of a bucket. Right. And we were looking through the telescope at at my friend, and they they lowered it, and they kept on lowering it, and then it disappeared when it went below their waist sure. and we couldn't see below their waist at all sure. Sure. and we took in, uh, into account kind of a margin of error for for the period of the waves and stuff like that yep. um, and then we positioned the telescope at a higher level and they could put it all the way down to their feet and we could still see it right so I was just wondering what, what you thought about that do it again do it is you only did it what you only did it one day we did it twice, um, but the first day we only had um, binoculars, Got so we couldn't, we couldn't really gather good. No, 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 it's okay. Um, remember, the scientific method, test, observe, repeat, uh, which is two, two things. One would be atmospheric lensing. Uh, remember, again, it's tricky. We, we've done this test, of course, many, many, many times. And there's some wonderful videos out there, some in our favor, some not in our favor. Um, what we have discovered is, and we didn't come up with this term, the atmospheric lensing effect is very, very real, which means since you're looking through a thin version of water, 
when it comes to certain distances, depending on a lot of different things when it comes to atmospheric effects, uh, you know, temperature and region and light in the sky, they can change basically everything about the test. So what I mean is keep going back and keep doing that test. Test it in, on a cold day. Test it on a warm day. Uh, test it when, you know, obviously don't test it in the rain or something like that. But I would counter it with this. Here's a perfect example. Uh, and I know, and actually in Canada, well, not where you guys are, you don't get it as much. Uh, but you do get some freezing temperatures every once in a while. Look up a test that was put on, you can find it on YouTube. It's on my channel too. Uh, it's called 7.53 frozen. That'd be like the keywords to look up. And what it was just this couple, I didn't authorize it or anything like this. They went down to a frozen lake and they uh or it was just about to freeze and they literally put the camera on the ice i think the camera was maybe two feet off the ice and the it was husband wife team and the wife 7.53 miles away put her flashlight literally it was one of those square boxy flashlights she literally put it on the ice so it was the, the light source was like right right there and it was as clear as day and they were talking to each other with cell phones and they recorded the whole thing so when it comes, but it was, remember, it was a freezing temperature day, but I've had other people say that near freezing temperatures, they, they get different results. So don't know in, in that case, all I can tell you is, you know, the positive stuff. And what, if you get a chance, I know that, where are you at? You, you said four kilometers or four miles? Four and a half kilometers. Okay, fine. See, the longer ones are better if you can. Uh, that'll give you a better idea. I, I don't know what sort of access you have to do. Uh, I... I had a chance once, but the weather is always so horrible between um, uh, Victoria. You guys know that know where that is, Victoria, and then uh, Port Angeles, Washington. But the the weather's awful, awful, awful between those two points. But find a long distance as long as possible as you can, and then tell me what the results are. I'd be love to see them. Thank you. Yeah. Are there any other uh, more questions that people have? Go a little more free form. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was wondering uh, why you decided to talk to us today, because it is it, it is interesting that you're willing to have your views challenged, and I respect that. Uh, um, be, 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 <laughs> the, the reason why I talk to as many people as I can is because for when you get into this, you want to tell people. It's kind of like finding out something so i mean you, you you don't know until you go to like a meetup and we, we we do there's all sorts of me in fact there's a meetup in vancouver um i can't pronounce the name of the city right off the top of my head uh it's east vancouver uh but when people get into it they get so enthused and so excited they can't help but do it i mean heck if you're gonna ask that question why why do and i did wasn't even into it much why do we have flat earth members that go out and do street activism that just blows me away i mean they literally will go on street corners with sandwich boards you know and and just start and they're not even you know what's it, you'd think it was like a church or something or where you know it's like you know jesus saves jesus saves but they um they they don't uh it's it's just raw enthusiasm that's all it is. Uh, I don't mind talking about it with anybody. And so far, it's gone really, really well. I've done it. God, I've lost count hundreds of times. And uh, it's, you know, it's it's just one of those things I like. I like informing people. It's like, look, there's something new out there. And it's not going away. And it just keeps getting bigger and weirder. And uh, I, I don't, I can't explain it. I That's a great question. I don't think anyone's ever asked me that. Which is like, why are you talking to us right now? I don't know. Why'd you call me? How's that? <laughs> if, I mean, there's the people, the people that I've interviewed with, and I've done everything from junior, do you call them junior highs in, in Canada? Yep. Junior high. I've, I've done everything from junior high newspapers to major networks. And the people are just, they, I don't know, they just are just so intrigued by the, by the concept because we all know about it. We've all heard of it. That's the other weird thing. It's the only topic I know of where I've never run into anybody where I've said, I said, oh yeah, flat earth. And they look at me like, never heard of it. <laughs> Don't know what it is. Everybody knows of the concept and most people are going, oh, that stupid thing. Yeah, it's awful. So no, I don't mind. I mean, I like, I like the questions. And if you're, if you're will, okay, let me take one, one, one more, one more way. I don't even have to pick up the phone most of the time. People just call me like you guys called me. I mean, just about everything I've done is unsolicited. I don't have to send out letters to universities. I don't have to do any of that stuff. People 
somehow find out and then they track me down and I put my phone number out there. It's like, yeah, you want to talk about it? Sure. Why not? It, it's kind of like, uh, I'll end it on this, which is, it's kind of like when I started this, I put my phone number in the description box of the videos and you guys are probably going, oh my God, why would he ever do that? It was because I wanted somebody to shoot it down. I wanted somebody to snuff out flat earth every day. It's like my new t-shirt. Every day I wake up and I try to destroy flat earth and every day I fail. And that's how it started. People, I, I put the phone number out there and just waited. I just stared at the phone. I was like, okay, somebody going to call me. And four years later, you know, here we are, conferences and meetups and books and radio shows and documentary. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, like in the documentary, uh, you said that you were so soaked into the uh, concept of flat earth that uh, if someone disapproves it, it will be difficult for you to get uh, out of it. So, for sure, you said that if someone disapproves, I will say the next day that it's uh, wrong. So, do you agree with the uh, idea that you will, if someone disapproves, that you will change your mind? Or you will not uh, let the people down. I only caught about half of that. Can, can, can you tell me the short version of what she said? Yeah, so, so if you were to, uh, if somebody were to produce one of these pieces of evidence, let's say the 4K camera, un, uncut yeah, yeah, yeah. 4K camera, or uh, the circumnavigation of Antarctica, or the spacesuit uh, proof, if they were to prove one of these things to you, would you change your view? Oh, I'd quit tomorrow. Are you kidding? <laughs> I would. Do you think I like doing this? This is just something I was thrown into. Uh, I honestly thought, yeah, no, I mean, when it comes to the evidence, I initially started as like, I was hoping somebody in the academic world would just give me something that would 100% be like, okay, no doubt. I, I have no rebuttal to, to, to any of that. Um, but if somebody had, yeah, the 4K proof for the spacesuit challenge or, or anything else they could come up with, I would, I would quit in a second. But every time I see something, it just aggravates us even more. You got to remember that beforehand, nobody questioned, at least in the United States, NASA was like a, a sacred cow. We, we weren't even allowed to, to question <laughs> NASA. And now everything they put out, we just break down in two seconds. I mean, there's some horrible production value when it comes to NASA. And Elon Musk, don't get me started with that guy. Oh, my God, that, that car in space, you're thinking, oh, that car, totally legit. It's like, really? Because it was a car. That car's space-proof? For a uh, perfect example, uh, sorry, let me, let me go the other direction because um, I love talking about Elon, um, <laughs> which is that car in space, again, beautiful, right? Uh, except that there were so many things wrong and everybody's glossed over. It's like, oh, well, it's a pretty image. It's like, oh, yeah, it's a pretty image, except that that car, uh, the tires didn't explode instantly, which they should have because, you know, they were pressurized on top of all the other pressurized systems in the car. Everything from window washer fluid to brake fluid, to, it was electric, so there's no oil. But everything else, uh, the window should have shattered. Remember, negative 250, positive 250. You, you guys all had friends that have poured warm water on a cold windshield. That goes over well. Those things should have spider webbed in two seconds. But you know the part that bugged me about it more than anything with that was two huge companies, right? Tesla and SpaceX, one private, one public. And there wasn't a single logo on that car anywhere. It's like, wow. I mean, this is, this is, you remember this is the United States down here. This is marketing territory. We market everything. I mean, if, if Frito-Lay could put a big banner on the moon, they would do it. And yet, the the spacex thing and and between spacex and tesla they didn't there wasn't a single logo on that car that car should have been covered like like nascar should have been covered not only that even the even the mannequin didn't have a logo on him i mean my god do you know how easy it would have been to go to disney instead of a mannequin you put i don't know a stormtrooper boba fett uh groot and iron man disney owns all of them Put, put, in fact, why it put him in a four seater, not that convertible. That thing would have paid for itself. None of that happened. You never saw the Tesla dealerships. There should have been a huge. That thing should have been in the banner of every Tesla dealership out there. Commercials, the whole nine yards, no marketing whatsoever. They just ran it. It was like they were trying to see if they could get away with it. In fact, I even had a guy. I even had a guy from mainstream media say, "Oh yeah, I didn't buy it." And I said, "Well, then why'd you re why'd you report on it?" He goes, "Oh, that's good images." 
No different than, sorry, let me throw one more. I know we're running out of time. Um, you guys remember the, the Red Bull jump? The Felix Bumgardner Red Bull jump where the guy supposedly jumped from the edge of space? That whole thing? That was a fisheye lens, meaning a peephole lens. Uh, it's severely curved Earth below him, even though it was only at 120,000 feet. That's nothing. We have video footage from weather balloons at 120,000 feet, which is perfectly flat. So somebody's lying. One of those two cameras is lying. I don't think, well, we didn't do the other ones, so it wasn't us. And I asked another media guy, I go, I go, you know the curvature of the Earth with the Red Bull jump wasn't that severe. So why'd you run it? He goes, it's a good image. It's dramatic. It's good. It's good. It's good media. I go, ugh. You're killing me. Anyway. More, More questions? Yeah, so. Um, so like, I heard there's um, scientific method and trust some science, but not all of it. How do you decide what you trust and what you don't trust? Oh, oh that's good. That's good. Um, so yeah, you're right. We we do try to employ the scientific mes method, and we do lean on it. And it is a little hypocritical for us to attack some science but not others. And what we what we try to stay consistent with is we believe science that we can prove for ourselves. Now I know that sounds a little limited because there's lots of scientists out there. It's like, what are you talking about? There's there's all sorts of scientific discoveries that that human you know that the average general public doesn't have access to. It's like, yeah, yeah, I know, and it's and it's tough to do, but unfortunately, science, uh, look, it, science unfortunately is in the same group like everything else. This, the world we live in, unfortunately, there's a lot of deception in it, and you guys know what I'm talking about. I mean, forget about the 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 other, you know, the fringe conspiracies. There's conspiracies in business and politics and sports and entertainment, and yes, even journalism and science. Uh, when sci science is, you know, they're made up of men and men can be a corrupt, corrupted women in the room. They get a total pass 2019 get woke, uh, but they absolutely get a pass. Men get corrupted very, very easily. Science will take the money. Scientists need Porsches too. And by that, I'm not picking so much on, on the institution. I'm picking on men, which is uh, look when products, when corporations get involved and products get rushed to market science will bend the rules and sometimes break them for their own needs and by that let's just look just real quick uh i don't know um lead paint <laughs> lead gasoline uh ddt and all the versions of ddt uh asbestos they're still paying out for that oh and how about all the scientists that said that cigarettes were just fine for you i can go on and on so uh, w it's hypocritical in some ways yeah you're absolutely right we're kind of doing uh we're walking on eggshells when we're, when, we're, when we're trying to do what we're doing. It's not perfect yet. Mark, thank you very much for agreeing to come and talk to us. Oh, yeah. I, I hope that uh, everybody here in the class has um, uh, learned learn. some, some things from, from what you're saying, uh, learned to, to take some perspective, uh, look at things in different ways. Um, and so, yeah, I think let's thank Mark for agreeing to talk to us. Thanks, guys. It was, it was my absolute pleasure. <laughs> oh, yeah, by the way, point uh, uh, infrared thermometer. Also, um, if you can buy one of these down at the hardware store, um, go ahead and check out the moon temperature. If you haven't looked that up, if you get a chance. Moonlight versus moon shade. It'll freak you out. <laughs> thank you very much, Mark. All right, guys. Bye-bye. Have a good one. Bye.